Hey guys, this is Rick coming at you with Weed to No Basis, the podcast for all things cannabis business related. Are you an entrepreneur? Have something you wanted to create, something you wanted to bring to life in the cannabis industry? Maybe you've always wanted to partake in one of the biggest industries in modern day history. This is the podcast to listen to that. First of all, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate um, the, the public support, San Antonio really coming out. Um, San Antonio spoken. Thanks y'all for Euclid Media as well. Look, this panel is very distinct and unique. Uh, it's called Women in Weed. And the women who are assembled here, you're going to meet. You've already met a lot of them. And we're going to go through a series of questions, and they're going to give you some very distinct answers. So first thing, and we'll just go down the row. Um, just introduce yourself. Tell us how you're involved in the cannabis space and about the business or brand you represent. And maybe share something about unique about you with the audience. Hi there, I'm Dr. Wendy Askew and I am an obstetrician and gynecologist by training and I left obstetrics a few years ago. I began studying about regenerative medicine and cannabis medicine and alternative forms of medicine about seven, eight years ago. Cannabis medicine more about three years ago and through the use of cannabis products I was able to kind of cure or at least get my psoriasis, my autoimmune condition, which was severe, extensive, under complete control and off of all my biologic agents. And it really opened my eyes to experience the healing power of it personally. I do advocating at the um, at the political level in town, I work with the Foundation for an Informed Texas and speak in Texas and at the legislature. I am on the medical advisory board for a Texas CBD company called Aletheia, and I was actually just asked to join the medical advisory board for True Leave, which is a national medical marijuana company based out of Tallahassee. So I advocate, educate, and I see patients clinically in my practice here in San Antonio. My name is Shada Tarabi. I'm co-founder and CEO of Restart CBD. We're a retail shop based in Austin, Texas, as well as operate eight e-commerce shops. So we sell across to all 50 states. Uh, professionally, I have an area of focus in the marketing space. I worked formerly for a corporate company where I was one of their early employees and got to scale with them and learned a lot of branding and marketing and just kind of creating and going to market with a brand. My interaction with Cannabis really started about 15 years ago. I've been a marijuana consumer the past decade plus of my life, but I didn't get introduced to CBD until about three years ago. I was in a car accident and I fractured my pelvis in two places. And my mother is who introduced me to CBD as a way of natural uh, plant-based recovery. And that was kind of the impetus for my sister and I founding our brand Restart. We just saw a lot of relief with the product and wanted to create a safe, space to educate and connect consumers to high quality CBD products. Hi everyone, I'm MJ Stapley. Um, I've been in the cannabis CBD space for about five years now. I started on the sell side um, with brand, working with brands, and then I started my own company, MJ Hybrid Solution, about two years ago. We're an online sales training and education platform for consumer facing employees and just basically all brands and dispensaries and retail shops. Um, so yeah, my background's corporate sales, management, and leadership. Hi everybody, my name is Tracy Lee Young, and um, I've been involved in cannabis for about five years, and really that, um, that whole world was opened up to me when the father of my eight children was diagnosed with stage four uh, cancer and given two months to live. Chemo just wasn't an option, and um, so I dove into researching what else could we do, and cannabis was the answer. And I'm going to share with you at 3 o'clock really what that story is all about and how it unfolded. But I chose to open up medical cannabis clinics. And today we've helped over 36,000 patients get back into the lives that they're living with the help of cannabis. And our, our motto is truly to help each and every person that walks through the door as if it's their last day on this earth. And we want to make sure it's the best that it can be and offer the most uh, amazing experience with doctors and cannabis than anybody could ever have. So I'm pleased to be here, thank you. I'm Deb Gabor. I am in the business of creating conditions of irrational loyalty for brands in every industry. My involvement in the cannabis industry, I'm pretty new to it, like probably just about a year and a half, um, but I recognized a huge opportunity. Uh, I showed a, a chart a couple of minutes ago when I was up here speaking, showing how dark horse brands came out of nowhere to like take over the most valuable companies in the world. 
think that we're going to see uh, within a couple of years cannabis be on the list, and uh, I want to be part of that. And my company is Soul Marketing, and uh, I'm really, really pleased to be here. So as you guys can see and hear, this is a pretty diverse group um, and also from different parts of the country, from Washington State, Northern California, Southern Cal, uh, Austin, Texas, and San Antonio. This isn't just a San Antonio phenomenon. This is what I believe is the epicenter, but this is um, across the U.S. But you all shared a little bit about you from being a physician, um, prior PR marketing, sales, variety of experiences. What in your past professional experience um, and what values were you able or have you been able to bring into the cannabis industry? Does that make sense? What, what in your past professional experience has translated into this industry today? As a physician, and like I said, I tried to keep an open mind about healing patients. So what, what I was able to translate over is just an open mind to offer patients other alternatives when I saw so many of them who had been on so many medications, prescription drugs, had so many surgeries for conditions that it all failed them. And yet doctors continue to do the same things again and again and again and were sometimes unable to offer patients relief from certain conditions. And a lot of times offering them something new, a CBD product, a regenerative medicine product, a stem cell product, a hyperbaric oxygen treatment, there are better ways to heal. And it just kind of opens my mind and that's what I share with patients. I know all of the different options for patients that leave the boundaries of prescriptions and surgical. Um, I also can offer those options, but if patients have conditions that other doctors have failed, relief for them, I have some new fresh ideas. I grew up in the technology industry, and that was an industry, you know, 25 years ago that was based on speeds and feeds. I see this industry to be uh, nascent and huge and really uh, a lot like the technology industry, which was the wild, wild west. I've heard a couple of people say it's like the wild, wild west. And uh, I bring that experience having actually done this kind of work for 30 years and what I've seen work in B2B and consumer branding to make a difference to all the companies here in this industry that are looking to find their success and achieve their goals. And I think branding is one of the foundational elements that's gonna help. So that's what I bring from my past to try to, to aid this industry. Yeah, I would say for me, founding Restart CBD, my whole intention was to create a safe space for consumers. When you come to my shop, everything from the way that you experience my brand to the information that you're hearing is with a consumer mindset first. What are the questions that we wanna understand? What are the types of products that we wanna consume? What is the way that we're going to be incorporating CBD into our lifestyle? So I like to think that I have a very practical approach to consumption because I'm actually using the products every day from pain management to now more presently anxiety relief and just kind of overall balancing my life from a day-to-day -day basis. For me, I think the biggest thing, you know, I came over, I, I came over and took an entry-level position in the cannabis space when I first started. And so obviously my sales experience and being able to understand consumers. And I worked in a very heavily regulated um, industry before, which is the for-profit education industry. And you had to learn how to sell without actually selling. And it's very similar, right? We're in an industry that people really need us and they need to be given the right product for their needs. So it's a way to be able to talk to them and help sell, but not in a way that you're not trying to push something on them. So that's, you know, I, I saw that huge connection when I started my company and taking the training platform that I had used as a manager in this other industry and bringing it here and I call it compassionate selling pretty much um, and meeting the consumer's needs. I think what I bring to um, this industry is passion. So I have been a massage therapist, I've been a nutritionist and while homeschooling my, my eight children I put myself through medical school to be a midwife and, and really I consider myself a natural nurturer and this industry really thrives on true compassion and to me compassion is caring and that's what we need more of along with education about the benefits of CBD pulling people away from these prescription medications that have got detrimental life, of, life side effects and um, that, that's really what I bring is I bring the heart. So the message that I, I want you guys to take from this is that we weren't necessarily born into this industry. 
We weren't born into CBD or cannabis. We come from backgrounds that have led us into that. That's, that's really the message. Thank you guys for that. Um, and that note, you'll also know this is a very distinct panel. And I want you guys to knock this out of the park, this question. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes in cannabis, whether it's minorities or, or whatever. There's a lot of stereotypes that exist. What, in your opinion, or what in your experience, whether as a woman or otherwise, is the best way that you can say or share to break that stigma and or grass ceiling? I'm a third generation veteran. My grandfather fought at World War II. My father was in Vietnam. I'm a mother. I'm an autoimmune disease patient. I'm a minority. I'm a military member. I'm a physician and I'm a cannabis advocate. So it breaks down a lot of the more conservative groups who are traditionally opposed. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, the veterans know the benefits of cannabis. They're just being denied it in Texas. So I, I, I think that the best way we can appeal to people, you don't need to get in people's faces or they're just going to cling to their lizards even more tightly. Just plant seeds and water them. Yay. <laughs> I love that. So I'm really passionate about reformation in the state of Texas. I was born and raised in Austin, and if you would have asked me five years ago if, let alone running a business in cannabis, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And so from my perspective, I think the biggest thing that we can do as individuals the power that each of us individually have. You are someone's mother, you are someone's brother, daughter, sister, friend, advocate, neighbor. You have the power to expose yourself to cannabis and make a decision for yourself of how that plant has helped shape and change your life. And when that plant changes your life, my hope is that you will transition that information to somebody that you care about because it's a one-to-one -one approach. It's really fun to come to conferences and make an impact on multiple people, but my ultimate joy is when I have that singular person who comes up to me after and says, you taught me something new, or I learned this from you, or shares a story with me about how cannabis has changed their life or their family members' lives. So realizing that the power of change nationally, but especially in the state of Texas, is in your hands, talk, educate yourself, and then when you have that experience, share it with other people. Yeah, right along the lines what they're saying. I mean, education is super important when you get in. Um, same thing. I came from a very conservative religious family and a political, political family in Arizona. So for me, it was just a little step at a time, and it was just education. I got in on the, started on the CBD hemp side, so it was a little easier for me to kind of wean in, like, you know, CBD hemp education, then, okay, now I'm in cannabis, you know. But it's all about educating from their mindset and understanding what they know about it. It's kind of like when you're talking to customers about your product, you got to ask them questions to figure out what they know and where, what level they're at so then you can speak to them on their level. And I think like a lot of politicians or a lot of people that really don't have a clue, you, it's, we get caught up in wanting to just like shake their head and just tell them what we want them to know, but you really have to step back and understand where they're coming from. Understand that they've what they've felt marijuana was for the last 30 years and slowly work your way in in, in a way that's going to get them to see it based on what they see from their perspective. I think we're all going to repeat kind of the same story because we all have the same heart and this, the same idea of compassionate care. But I think as soon as you have that person see a difference, then they actually become an extension of you and they start sharing their experience. And as a whole, we start changing the entire community and this entire stigma about what we're doing will completely transcend into something where CBD becomes a household name and everybody's using it as opposed to things that are taking away the life that they're living. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different angle on the answer to this question because I don't think that there's anything that I could say that, that would be any better additive to what you four ladies just said. I wanna take it from the approach of being just a woman in business and in entrepreneurship. I think that the world is open to people of color, to women, to young people, to older people, people who are changing careers and finding new pathways. This industry is ripe for that kind of innovation and ripe for opportunity, really for anybody who wants to do it, because I think that, I think, you know, overcoming those stereotypes is part of the industry, but it is such an open, wide, and giving, and generous category right now that I think that there's no better category that if you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to like break convention, I, I think this is the place to do it. So, Deb, I'm gonna stay with you for a second. 
Do you believe women are different entrepreneurs than men? And if so, how are they different in this space? That's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, so, you know, we, we understand biological differences between men and women, and we're just hardwired in a different way. Um, I, like, as a woman entrepreneur for the last 16 years running my own company, um, I can say that it has not been entirely easy doing that. There, uh, I think that women in all businesses that I have experienced come to the table with, with almost a different, a different approach sometimes just a little bit more heart-centered. That's not to say that a, a largely male approach to business is bad, not by any stretch of the imagination. It's just different. Uh, I, you know, I, all I can do is speak from my own experience, both as a, a person who has run businesses, but also as a person who has worked with literally thousands of brands. So I have a pretty big sample set that I can look at. Women run businesses, and businesses that have women on their boards and women advisors and women investors, they're more sustainable, they're more productive, there's less drama, I hate to say it, they're more profitable and there's actual research out there from the Kaufman Foundation on entrepreneurship that talks about this. And so what you see is a very sort of holistic, heart-centered approach to business. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not hard-hitting entrepreneurial finance geniuses also, but we add something to it. But there, there is actual empirical data out there that shows that businesses that are led by women have women in leadership, investors, advisors, et cetera, become more sustainable, more profitable, and contribute in a more positive way to the economies in which they operate. Love it. Guys, those, these are, bang these out of the park. Tracy Lee, I have one for you. You're, you're a family woman. <laughs> family. You, you, have, you have kids. I so do. So tell me, uh, share with us, what do your family members, your children maybe, or your significant other, what do they think about you being in the medical marijuana industry? Well, initially, you know, certainly there was that, as we talked about earlier, that stigma, you know, you're doing what? Um, but once they start seeing the passion and the lives that are changed, everything shifted to more of a support. Um, I've got three of my children that are running my businesses, and they get it. Um, my younger children start talking to their teachers at school about, have you ever tried cannabis? And although that's, you know, not a conversation you're supposed to have in school, now they're very comfortable with it because they do. They see the benefits and they do see the lives that are being changed throughout the history of um, my presence in the, in the industry. And it's, um, it's kind of changed our entire family dynamic from you know, having a house full of teenagers where everybody kind of does their own thing to more of a, a family unit. And we've become working together for one greater cause. Nice. MJ, different question for you. So you work specifically on the sales and marketing side. You, my words, not yours, you help um, dispensaries, brick and mortar shops increase sales. In your experience, is the female a different type of consumer than the male? What do you think about that? Different type of consumer? Consumer, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think statistics show like women make up like 65% or more of the consumers women are a higher consumer, but that's also to say a lot of them come in for their husbands. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it said in the statistics, not me. Uh, I, yeah, I think that what I see, it, it, it seems like women are a little bit more timid, at least older, like kind of people that have come in that are maybe a little bit older and they're kind of like, oh, this is a thing now. I'll notice they get more, women seem to be a little more timid or ask a little more questions like uncertain where men, it seems like, oh, that's great. Okay, what else? Like, they would buy the whole store because they're just so excited about being there. So I, I think there's a little bit of a dynamic and women may be still a little cautious about how to approach it. But, I mean, I don't notice it, a, an extensive difference. I just know, you know. Gotcha. So about 65% But I of think that was the statistic. It was like 65% of consumers is women. Is that? Yeah. 
With respect to the healthcare portion of that, women are known to be the gatekeepers of their family's health, and that's the only reason why hospitals care at all about the labor and delivery units and why they'll build these giant women's pavilions is because if they can capture, they don't get a lot of revenue for delivering the babies, they take care of them, but if those women bring their husbands, bring their fathers, bring their father-in-laws, bring their children to their facilities, then they'll get the neurosurgery res revenues, they'll get all the other revenues. So women are the controllers and the gatekeepers for the health keepers dollars, so never underestimate the power of women in driving all the GDP and revenues on the, on the health care side. I want to add one little thing to that, which it's important that everybody realizes that while women control 65% of household purchases, they still only control a fraction of the household finance. And the cannabis industry is a place where we can change that dynamic by providing more opportunity for women as entrepreneurs and business owners and business leaders, investors and advisors. Gotcha. Hey, Shada, something for you. And, and um, they'll take this the wrong way, but you're, you're younger and you're a female. Is there a time in your journey so far as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, and as a spokesperson, you're speaking all over the place, where you just wanted to throw in the towel, wanted to give up, and if so, um, what's kept you going? And what would you say to somebody who's maybe experiencing some of those roadblocks because of uh, being a minority or a female, or let's say a, a, in a disadvantaged position? Unfortunately, I don't really get you know, turned down by myself too often. I'm very headstrong. so. I haven't let that prohibit me from moving forward. I think what I would say to someone who wants to be in a similar position of, um, you know, a voice. You know, it's again, it's great to have the one-to-one -one voice, but if you want to have a one-to-many voice, how do you go from there to here? Uh, networking has been a huge tool in my toolkit. Doesn't matter if I'm talking to the person who's take, taking my, you know, badge at the door, to the person who's standing at a booth, to the person who is inviting me to speak. Everybody that I interact with has some sort of value as a human, right? We're all valuable individuals. And so I also rely on people's unique gifts. So my unique gift, I like to think, is communication and talking to a room full of people. So I lean into that, and I think that is what has allowed me to continue to grow is just by leaning into my strengths. You might not feel comfortable being in front of a thousand group of people, but you might feel more comfortable starting a small meetup group and becoming an advocate that way. Like I said, talking to your neighbors, your family members, those are all very important roles that we can take in this cannabis industry. So not looking at what we're doing as, you know, I'm not like that or I want to be like that. How do I get there? It's looking to yourself and saying, how can I add some value to the conversation? What are my unique skills and gifts? And then that's really where you should start investing in. Love it. Love it. So guys, here's the, here's the good news, bad news. The good news is that these women are going to be around for the rest of the day. The bad news is we need to wrap because the next speaker is ready to come up. Uh, the goal for today was, I believe, hit because I wanted you to hear in a a unique perspective from women from all different parts of the country, different parts of the industry, doing some incredible things that I consider friends. Um, but we do have to wrap, and they will be around for a little bit longer. So if you want to talk to Dr. Askew or Shada or anybody up here, by all means, grab us, grab them, um, and grab a photo, do some, uh, continue the conversations, please. But we need to wrap this segment up because the next speaker is up on deck. I really appreciate you all being here, and thank each of you for being here. Thank you all.